name. If I knew what I was, I would say, I'd be really excited. God is a way of saying things better than we can ever imagine to say it. Hide this power in this place. I don't know whether I'm in pain or whether God's just all over me. And ah, God. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Is holy. Yes. You have got a clean house. You have got to see that the things of the world is nothing compared to what God has for you. God's trying to raise the standard of holiness in the body because if He can, so will His glory flow. power of God is released to the degree that obedience is exercised. No more. I tell you, there's power in holiness. There's so much power in holiness. If we could just grasp a hold of it, you'd run off to holiness. The Bible says when they put Daniel in the lion's den, when Daniel came out, the first thing Daniel says is, Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Oh, my king, God, God has shut the mouths of the lions because there was innocence found in me. He even gave the reason. He says, God has shut the mouth of the lions because there was innocence found in me. My God, find innocence in us, God. Find innocence in us, God. I tell you, it'll shut the devil up. He won't be able to touch you. I prayed for a man a little while ago down in the bottom of Arkansas, not last week. Last week we were in Alabama, but the week before that we were near Eldorado, Arkansas. And um, he came in the office and he was bound by drugs and there was a homosexual spirit all over him because all of his friends were in a homosexuality. He hadn't got into it yet, but it was all over him. You see, he had been seeing that. I looked at him, and when I went and prayed for him, I thought, I always used to go wild casting out devils. But then something inside me just said, look at him. And I looked into his eyes, and I said, brother, open your eyes. Just open your eyes and look at my eyes. I looked in his eyes and I looked in his eyes. I watched his eyeballs and I said, I looked straight in his eye and I said, You foul spirit. You come out right now because I can see you. I said, You know you can see me. I said, You can't stop this because either we're going to turn into a war or you can just leave nicely right now. And I said, Don't close your eyes, brother. You look at me. And I opened his eye, and I watched his little eyeballs, those little black pulpits. I watched them just go, whoosh, open up real big like this. His eye, like, literally opened up the black part, just grew like two, three times the size, and just suddenly shut down, and he hit the ground. And he was delivered. Nobody screamed. Nobody shouted. But God showed me something that day down in that church. The eye is the gateway to the realm of the supernatural in more than one way than you can imagine. I've preached on this thing so much. I've preached on new realms of vision. I've preached on perceptions image. I've preached on the eye, the eye, so much stuff on the eye. But yet we have not sanctified our eyes. We haven't done as Job said in Job 29 verse 6. He said, 
Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon evil. Yet we say, God, touch me. You'd be amazed what just one little show does. You'd be amazed what one, one little action does. It causes an attitude or an emotion to rise. It's an instant response to whatever you've seen. Steep. You watch something violent when you walk away. If somebody speaks to you hard, even your wife, you, you react hard. You go, wait a second, I normally don't do that. Now, if you don't do it for several weeks and something else comes up, a certain motive rises again. Just depends on what you looked at. And so we begin to, let, we begin to feed that nature. That nature of sin. Some of you used to, I remember one time getting kicked out of a church because I said sickness means that there's something between you and God. And you ask my wife, I got kicked out of that church of about seven, eight hundred in Florida. Because he said, brother, how can you say sickness means there's something between you and God? Well, what is sickness? Is it something between you and God? What is it? How is it related to sin? Sin works sickness. Sin's working sickness in you. When sin grows, it opens the door for sickness to come in. Sickness does mean there's something between you and God. You say, brother, did I do anything wrong? You don't have to do anything wrong. There's something that has come in. through some avenue. It can come through a curse. That's because of sin from the previous generation. But a curse is something between you and God. And so you want the curse broken. Well, you didn't do anything about it. It came from your mother and father who were alcoholics. But that's what a curse is. A curse is sin that's carried over from one generation to another. We're all born in sin. You deal with sin and you'll have sickness dealt with. That sounds strong. But I believe one of the things the Spirit of God spoke to me while we were worshiping God. He says, he says raise the standard of holiness. Because the body has set their own standard. Not one that I've chosen for them. They set it based upon the other person next to them. Or what they do is they compare themselves with somebody else. You can't compare yourself with anybody who's in the natural if you want to walk in the supernatural. You can't, can't compare yourself with anybody who's on natural ground if you want to step in all that God has for you. My standard for Christianity is not you. My standard for Christianity is God. I want to be like my daddy. I have no lesser standard. I want to be as holy. He says, be holy for I am holy. He doesn't say, maybe be holy or try your best. Or even make a suggestion. Some of you, I think you forgot God's standard. God's standard says, I want you to be like me. That's my standard. That's the rules in my heaven. You're a citizen of... Wait, of heaven. I've called you to be seated with me in heavenly places. Come on. Come on. There's no sin. There's no law for There's no sin in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want a sinless earth. Do you think God can produce sheep nations? Sure, He can. You mean the entire nation that will fall off to God? Sure he can. He's working at it. Prophetically speaking, God is bringing forth sheep nations. He's working right now in the world of setting up government leaders in godly positions. There are presidents in Africa. 
Actually, there's two, three that I know of right now who are spirit-filled, born-again, tongue-talking presidents. You say, what God's trying to do is trying to establish a sheep nation. That means where the whole nation follows up to God and holiness. Amen. God is trying to set into place the fullness. Why would God want to come back for anything less than something that has come into maturity? See, some people say, well, brother, I like escapism plan. It's like the story I told last week when we were in Pittsburgh. I mean, several weeks ago when we were in Harrison about the little worm changing into a minor butterfly in the cocoon. And the little boy looked with his magnifying glass and he, he started seeing that little worm and he started seeing it becoming a butterfly and he saw the wings flapping and flapping against the cocoon's walls. But it wasn't Moabi. It wasn't the Moab. It wasn't the appointed time. There's an appointed time. And the Bible says that the thief comes in the night, but the Bible says that those of the light are not ignorant of the night. What are you saying? The thief will... It says when Jesus comes back, he'll come like a thief in the night. But the Bible says those of the, li of the light, two scriptures below that, those of the light are not ignorant of the night. Wait a second, we forgot about that one. Some people still think it's a surprise. Not if you're in the light. Everybody knows the appointed day when Elijah was getting ready to go up. Don't you know Elijah's going up today? Don't you know Elijah's going up today? Don't you know Elijah's going up today? All the prophets getting ready to cross Jordan River. Don't you know Elijah's going up today? And Elijah represents the righteous alive. Don't you know the aliens are coming with their space shuttles and they're going to take us away? <laughs> Alien entities. Some people are still living in the twilight zone. I remember years ago when I first came to America in 982 and flipped on the, on the TV. I was actually living in Richard Roberts' house for a week and a half. First time I ever saw cable television in my life. Never seen TV. And I'm here at Richard Roberts. Now, I love Richard Roberts. I'm just using the example. That's whose house I was at. Come on. When I started flipping through those channels, it freaked me out. See, because I was used to going to a Hindu home or a Muslim's home. And there in that home, they had all their furniture sitting around in a beautiful... And at the corner of the house, they have a little altar. And on top of the altar, they had all the different gods. And the Hindus have a lot of gods. They have, they have the god of the weather, the god of the mountains, the god of the sport. Come on, they have all these different gods, 30, 40 different gods. And if I had to name you, them all off for you, it will shock you. Because the first day I arrived in America and was at Richard Roberts' house, I flipped on the TV. And I thought, this is amazing. More than one channel. Chan I flipped the channel, weather channel. Wow. Next channel, sport channel. I thought, oh. the next channel was like, I, when I hit the third channel, I was like, my God, the Hindu gods have just become animated. <laughs> and you're trying to set yourself above a Hindu and Muslim? No, nah, you have no right. We have no right. If you can sit there and flip through the cable channel, you ain't any better than a Hindu or Muslim. Come on. We, we like to put ourselves up like we're really something. But we just found a, way, a different way to worship them. Actually, their stronghold is a lot stronger. Because I can go to a Hindu community and cast the devil out of them. I mean, ask my wife. Bloody lick. Quick, easy, eh? Deliverance is simple. Indian communities, deliverance is simple. America, deliverance is a different story. The stronghold is greater. It's easy to cast out devils when I'm overseas. I mean, I was in Siberia, ran off the stage. We cast out devils out of three, four hundred people in about five minutes. They were all going, blah, 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 hit in the ground. 
America, you lay hands on one guy and he's blind for five hours. I've never seen anything like it. I'm serious, since I bury you, I saw 300 people get delivered in about five minutes. I just ran up the stage and barely would touch them, just waved my hand. Free, devil come out, go. You know, I mean, they, 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 in America, I call a guy out. Down in Louisiana, I remember calling out. I said, Brother, step in the aisle. God wants to set you free. Remember that time? I said, Brother, step in the aisle. I said, I said, that you seem to be bound by demons. I said, come out, you devil. I mean, this guy hits the ground, lifts off the ground. Four, he came in the air, his whole body levitated four or five feet in the air. And I'm going, lo and behold. I mean, I've never seen a guy. I've never seen a guy fly before in my life. But this guy came up in the air like. And he was like. And then fell to the ground, delivered. I thought. I never even seen anything like that in Africa or Siberia, but America. I mean America, Jehovah Witness priest. Were you at that meeting? What, okay, we went to a Jeho one time, this Jehovah Witness priest came to a church. I, I recognized him. He had been a Jehovah Witness priest for 25 years. God said, I said, brother over there, I need your help tonight. God just wants me to have you help me. The ushers wanted to help me. I said, I don't need you ushers. I want you to usher, brother. He says, okay. I said, have you ever asked you before? No. Hey, he's just coming to check this church out. I said, you're going to learn real fast how we charismatics do things. Come here, brother. I had him usher that night. Do you know God said to him, don't pray for him. Jehovah Witness preached was ushering for me. God said, don't pray for him. He said, he's going to come back. Two nights. Third night, God says to me, now pray for him. I remember going to pray for this guy. He hit the ground. I never seen anything like it. He went, Bleh! So I put my foot on his stomach. And for what? The four or five aisles of the church cleared out. <laughs> and for about 30 minutes, this guy just kept going. Bleh! Bleh! And I was like, I said, God, what's going on here? He said, there's a demon leaving him for every person he baptized in Jehovah Witness. Um, you know, isn't that Wild. But I truly believe that God is trying to bring something into the body right now and infuse the body with a holiness that will shut the devil's mouth. Let me tell you, you can fight people. I've gone through that before. You want to react, people do you wrong, stab you in the back. You know, I, I, I can handle almost anybody. But when it comes to ministers stabbing you back, I mean, uh, you know, other people, fivefold ministry stabbing you in the back. You've got to work through a greater dimension of forgiveness. There's some people who aren't in church today because some pastor, as far as they were concerned, stabbed them in the back. I guarantee you, I bet you if I went one mile this way and one mile this way, I'd find people who are mad at some pastor. I don't have to go very far to find people mad at pastors. Some pastors have been a jerk. It's true. Some people have done things in the flesh. In revival, you can't produce anything in the flesh. You can scream, holler, shout all you want, but I've learned something about revival. Don't push the thing. Don't try and make it happen. It has to be a natural spring. If you pump it up, it'll wear out. It has to be an outflowing. It has to be an outpouring. It has to come from really the depths. And you've got to let it flow out of holiness. Some people will sometimes come to our meetings and say, Wow, bro, there's so much power in your meeting. I said, Well, you want to know the secret of that? Come and live with me for a couple of weeks. Well, like my secretary says, you'll probably fall over from all the work, but. But I guarantee you won't have any time for sin. And I guarantee you by the time we're finished with you, there'll be power flowing. Amen. Come on. And do you know what happens? There's a, such a cleansing and peace that comes into place, a rest, a liberty. I mean, and it just is just... She does that every day at the office. I don't think there's a day go by that she isn't laughing...
we had... <laughs> We had a guy come in our office one time and he walked in and he just started getting touched in the office and he was like, God, yeah, wow. I, I remember when, 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 um, <laughs> oh, I tell you. Some of you, God, I'm telling you, if you clean house, God can just move in there and have his way. And there'll be so much that'll happen for you. I have sensed a new strength coming to me that I've never experienced before in my life. And I tell you, I, I sense barriers. God's breaking barriers of sin in my life. I wish I was absolutely 100% just holy, holy, holy. But I know that every somebody says, Brother, are you going to a high level of glory? But I found out this is what happened. Consciously, in my actions and things I do, God breaks off. God breaks another barrier. And when God breaks another barrier, I find that if I just take a step, I'm, I just move to a higher level of glory. Come on. God weighs the spirits in a balance. I, I forgot my worm story. Somehow I'm losing track of where I'm going or coming. Where am I at? And you know, I think one of the, re my wife, she has no problems expressing joy. You know what? There's no scent on clogged. Let me tell you, there was a time that Isaac came along and the Philistines came along and they plugged up all the wells that Abraham had built for Isaac. And the Bible says the word Isaac means laughter. The word Isaac means laughter. And the Bible says that laughter went out and unplugged the wells of his father Abraham again. Let me tell you, Philistines, all those different tribes of the Philistines that plugged up those wells represented different sins. And the devil's always out to plug your well. You won't have a problem with joy bubbling out of you and the expression of joy when, then, when things get clean. You won't. It, 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 it's like the, the pressure or anxiety or worry concerning, did I do something wrong? What's going on? Uh, or, or some overwhelming dream that you had the night before that you didn't have the power or control over that dream. Holiness will clean your dreams up. Come on, it'll clear your vision. <laughs> but I tell you, that little boy, he came along and he thought he'd help that little butterfly get out, see? So cut the top of the cocoon off. And when that little butterfly crawled out, he flapped his wings and flapped his wings, but guess what? He couldn't fly. He needed that cocoon to break himself free. <laughs> You're in a cocoon, whether you like it or not. And God's trying to get you to mount up his wings as eagles. And he's trying to get the creations growing and waiting for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. Creation saying, come on, man, child, come forth. Son of God, come forth. 
in all your fullness and all your glory. Come forth. Don't come forth prematurely, but there's an appointed time to come forth. And God's trying to say, come forth. Grow up and come forth. And oh, I tell you, the rivers will flow freely. Bam, 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 bam. The river. Bam, 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 bam. The river is flowing. Bam, 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 bam. The river is flowing. Something like that. I don't know about anybody else. I feel a river. I feel something free. I feel those clear, clear crystals of love flowing from the throne room above. They're clear crystal rivers of love because healing flows on the wings of love. It's clean. It's clean. It's clean. The cleaner it gets, the greater the power there will be. The purer it gets, Oh, the stronger that force and anointing, the healing rivers of God will be. Because you've gone past the veil and you're anchored in the throne room of God. Amen. And out of your belly flows rivers of living water. Amen. Oh, I don't think God expects anything less than that. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I think I've got to do this message as well. That's the giving message. That was my giving message. That's a good giving message. Amen. Did you did you get that giving message? You see, you don't get it yet, eh? Think about it for a second. <laughs> Come on. You got the nature of God. The nature of God loves to give. It just oozes out of you. You are so excited about giving. You just can't help yourself. I somehow beside myself. Oh. Somehow my eyes are not working right. Somebody in here, God's got a breakthrough for you. Somebody here, God, God wants to shut that line of debt. He's saying, clean house and the blessings of God will flow. I tell you, favor will go and it'll show and it'll flow and you'll know. You'll say, what in the world happened? It'll have nothing to do with you. It'll be God. That's right. You're a child of God. He'll have His way. Let go. Let God. Not complicated. Simple. It's easy. past is gone. It's over. There's nothing you can do about yesterday. So forget about it. You can't change tomorrow. You know what I mean, past. I mean, tomorrow. Where am I at? What's tomorrow? I mean, I mean, you know what I mean. Yes. Well, you know what I mean. 
You know. Forget about it. Some of you, God wants to turn you around. Oh, I... Every, every vessel that was brought into the temple where the glory of God fell had to be of a precise weight. And you have a treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God. And God wants to pour out the riches of His glory through His vessels of mercy for which He has prepared beforehand for glory. But that vessel God's trying to bring to the weight He desires. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this will, but be transformed by the newness of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That means he's trying to bring your vessel. That you may present your vessel. Come on. God's trying to present you. He's trying to set you in a place saying, I want to pour out my glory and nothing less. He's trying to strip you clean. I'd ne- I felt more conviction come on me. The more I know about God, the more convicted I get. Am I right, Pastor? The more you get into God's presence, the more you break down. Go, God, I'm a sinner. God, help me. God, I'm frail. My God, just clean me up, Lord. I could spend every single day at the altar for the rest of my life. When you get in the presence of God, that's where you're at. It's just to have revival. We have everyone at the altar every day. But to tell you the honest truth, I think I, I think I tell you, I'm really enjoying what's happening in Pensacola because some people they need to be at the altar every single day. You can't find an altar call in the, in the New Testament anywhere. I never got saved that way. That was a 1700 thing. But I tell you, getting on your knees and getting clean before God and changing your ways. I'm 100% for that. Amen. Every single, I, I tell you, one day when we ran the revival, did anybody ever come to Alpena? When we went to Alpena long ago, like a year and a half ago. When we went to Alpena a year and a half ago, there was one night I preached on transparency. I've got a book on the back table called Transparency. God, something happened to me that day when I did this book. It's called Transparency. When I minister on transparency, like this pulpit, <laughs> God showed me things about how all His glory and honor will return Him and how He would desire us to flow. And, when, I, and when, I, when this book was written, Transparency, God began to show me something. <laughs> I never. I remember standing up one night in revival. I can't remember one night was, but I was standing like this, and people started running, and I felt like beams of light were shooting through my body. I could feel it. When I closed my eyes, I just saw like there was a huge light behind me coming down from heaven, and I felt it shooting straight through me. And as the people ran forward, I remember they didn't even get like five, ten feet of the stage that night. They, they, every time they got like five feet of the stage, they would just hit the ground. How I many people were running that night, just getting whacked like by something, just. And Pastor Rick said to me that night, it was a, one of the most powerfulest meetings he ever seen. Never seen anything like that. But when the meeting was over, I ran to the back corner outside of the sanctuary. The minute I finished that message, I didn't even stay. After people were just falling on the power everywhere, and I started seeing this happen. Because when I started seeing the light of God shine through me like that, I, I started seeing everything that was a darkness more clear than I'd ever seen it before. And I ran. He was wondering why I ran out of the meeting. I ran out of the meeting, went to his office, and I just wept. I just cried. I broke down. I said, God, help me. This is one of the most powerful means I ever saw in my life. Nobody could get like 10 feet to the stage that night. It was so much anointing. But when I went to the office and I began to weep and cry for God, the pastor said, man, that's the most powerful night you've ever had so far. What's wrong? I said, let me tell you, pastor, I saw more sin in my life tonight than I'd ever seen before. Someone said, God, I want more of you. I want more of your holiness. Let me tell you, if you want more of God's holiness, 
He will show you more of your sin that you have to deal with. And He will raise the standard of holiness in your life. God's trying to bring you to a higher standard. But oh, the price is great. The price is great. I promise you, you will feel God's conviction on a continual basis. You will. Every day I feel God breaking me. Every day. Every time He breaks me more, I can sense more anointing flowing. Because first the alabaster box has to be broken before the ointment can flow. And I tell you, you got to let God... We sang the song this morning in my heart, just brokenness, brokenness. That's what I long for. Brokenness, brokenness. That's what I want. Holiness, holiness. And I tell you, when I began to sing that song, I tell you, conviction came on me. I thought, I don't think we're broken enough. I don't think we've laid our lives down in the altar enough. I don't think we've surrendered enough. I guarantee you, you let God break you more. More of Him will have His way through, you, through your life. Let God rule and reign through your life. Just say, God, I give you my all. There's so much power in that. Some of you, God's calling you to do that. In every area of your life. My, he's trying to tear down strongholds. I can't believe I'm sharing that. I'm not, I'm in a different mode or something. It's better to express what God's doing than express what I want. God breaking me can touch you more than me ministering what I want to minister. It's the same in your life. God's trying to tell some of you, lay your ministries on the altar. Lay your call on the altar. You lay your call on the altar and God will give you a higher call. It's not your call in the first place. It's God's. Oh, I tell you, the price of ministry is everything. It's everything. It's a great dimension. There's no boundaries to that. I mean, if you want to be free, just give God your all. If you want to be healed, give God your all. If you want Him to have your way in your life, give God your all. There's so many big people writing books right now and they struggle against cancer or they struggle against some infirmity. I don't think it's necessarily they struggle against the infirmity. It's a struggle of surrender. It's a struggle of surrender. Saying, God, possess my body, spirit, soul. Have your way. Touch through me. Heal through me. Do what you want to do. But it's spiritual warfare. Some people, their sickness is spiritual warfare. It's a warfare of surrender. God, I yield to your omnipotence. I yield to your omnipotence. Oh, my God, my God, my God. I yield to your omnipotence. I yield to your omnipotence. I yield to Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer. My God, I yield to Jesus, the healer flowing through me. I yield to him. Have your way, Jesus, the healer in me. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way. Possess every cell in my body. Express yourself through every cell in my body. Let your full expression be known and exploded. And let come on, let it be like a tree that's bearing fruit. God, let that anointing flow through those branches, and let that anointing produce the glory, the fruit. Of all that you are. So that when others see me, all they see is the essence of that glory of God and the fruit of that holiness. God, express yourself through me. (laughs) My God, it's your Bible. I just have your way, Lord. (laughs) My God, what can you do? I say, God, just move 
You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. You don't have an option. You just forget about arguing with God. I mean, forget about going and renting another video again in your life. Just forget about it. Forget about it. Save your money and put it into the ministry. Give it to God instead of watching some trash. And break that spirit of selfishness out of your life. I praise you, Jesus. Kill that thing. Just become a giver. Be like your dad in heaven. He doesn't sit down and watch a bunch of trash. Jesus never meditated on the power of the natural. The day the devil set up every tool to manipulate and control your mind and show you the powers of tornadoes, and the powers of storms. The weather channel is there as a demonic stronghold to break your back and your authority to be able to stand against it and say, I rebuke the winds and the waves. It said to strip your might and power to stand up against it. It said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, storm, back off. Because I've been given authority and power from heaven. It said to break that down in your life. I never seem to do any good. Walt Disney set up. It is a perfect setup for your children. It's there from the day they're born to manipulate their minds to show them the power of Mother Earth. From the, from the beginning of 1940, you can go all the way back to Bambi to show her dying because the devil wants your kids to see death and see the power of death. And from the time you're born, he's working his way into your children's mind to manipulate and control them and break down their godly inheritance and authority that God has destined them for. Amen. He'll do everything he can to strip you of the power that God wants to explode in you. Today when somebody comes in with one leg shorter than the other, we take them to the store. The church raises money to help them out. To get them an artificial leg. Instead of stepping into the creative power of God and say, leg grow. We lean more on the arm of the flesh than we do anything else in the world. No wonder God can't release His creative power through His body. The spirit of holiness is not there. And the spirit of all that God wants to do is not there in the first place. We've had the devil have us meditate so much on hunger programs every single time. I remember five, six years ago, I have not watched TV barely in the last seven, eight years. But I remember any time you see something, oh, Compassion Ministries, send your money to Ethiopia, starving Ethiopians. I say, my God, where is, where is, where is the expression of Jesus through a man in Ethiopia saying, feed me first like the prophet Elijah to that woman at Zarephath. Where is that? Where is that man to stand there and say, Well, so Ethiopian, you just, you're just barely starving. What do you have? Feed me first. And I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll take these loaves of fishes and we'll multiply and produce a miracle of provision. But the devil's out to strip the authority of the church and get the church into medical programs to send medicine here and medicine there and food here and food there instead of getting you to step in your divine, godly, creative abilities and powers that God has destined to flow through you. My God, God created the universe and as a father, he expects nothing less of his son. Do you think my son's going to do anything less than I can do? God does not expect anything less of you than, than he'll do himself. Let me tell you whether you realize or not, you are the bride of Christ and when you enter into the realms of glory, you will give birth to a child, you will birth the supernatural creative dimensions that God will do from that day forth, from the time that God comes back and you get caught up in heaven with him and enter into the realm of the spirit and take on a glorified spirit being throughout the universe guess what, God is going to move you into dimension, from that day forth you will be the one creating universes you will be the one moving in God's creative power because that's what he's destined you for and you better realize it now then later yeah, amen, amen. Yes. come on some of you start thinking come on come on tell that mind shut up and become the son of God you're called to be 
Tell that flesh to shut up and be the son of God. You're called to be and the daughter of God. You're called to be. My God, my God, my little boy. He starts to walk like me. He starts to talk like me. He starts to act like me. And my God, one day I was praying, God says to me, can you see your little boy? He says, he says I want to be just like my daddy. He goes, come on. He says, who put that in him? I did. I'm trying to put the same thing in you. Some of you explore every other avenue. You explore the father. The, come on, some of, you are, some of you are so caught up with the devil. The devil's more of your father than God is. You spend more time listening to the devil telling you, watch this trash, meditate on this trash, look at that, do that, do that. So the standard of holiness is so weak in your life because your father's the devil. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. He said, I'm of God, but you are of your father, the devil. Didn't Jesus say that? He said, I know where I'm from, and I know who's my father, and I've been sent from God. But you, you don't know where you're from, for you act just like your father, the devil. I thought these were the Pharisees and Sadducees. These were the religious folks of the day. These were the ones who prayed, who prayed, prayed several times a day, fasted often, paid their tithes. Woo, that sounds like really good people to me. But Jesus said, you are your father, the devil. And I think there's a lot of people of their father, the devil, in the church today. Who's your father? The devil or God will start acting like God if he's your father. Amen. Start acting like the son of God you are. Start acting like the son of God you are. Let me say it again. Start acting like the son of God you are. You've been given authority and power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. Yeah. My God, there's something bigger in you than this entire universe. Yeah. There's something more powerful in you than any opposition or every power or authority in this world. It's called God in you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. My life is hidden with Christ in God. My tell you, that's the greatest secret place in the whole world. My life is hidden with the anointed ones anointed. I mean God. How can the devil touch that? How can the devil get close to that? He can't touch that. My God, become the son of God you are. Become the son of God God's called you to be. How does your daddy do things? Start thinking about it. Amen. Oh, God, I want to learn your ways. I want to know your ways. My Lord. My Father. <laughs> He's becoming more of a father to me now than he ever has been before. I never keep thinking about Elisha following Elijah. Oh, it took him a while. All the time he was a servant and he washed his feet. But there came one day when Elijah got ready to be taken up into heaven. When the chariot of fire came down, Elisha looked up into heaven and said, For the first time in Elijah's life, Elisha's life, being with Elijah, he never recognized Elijah's father. But for the first time in his life, when the chariots of fire come down from heaven, he looks up into heaven and Elisha makes a statement, Father, Father, the chariots of fire and the horsemen thereof. And I can see Elijah sitting in that chair and going, oh, he recognizes it. He sees I'm really his father. He see, he's been his spiritual father in the faith. And he said, I want a double portion. The word double portion meant in the, in the nation of Israel, it wasn't just a double portion. What it meant is if you had five, six sons, the oldest son, when it came time for the father to die, would lay hands on the oldest son and say, I'll give you a double and all the others would just get one portion, one portion, one portion. But the elder son, he would say, I'll give you a double portion of my inheritance. So usually he was the one who ended up inheriting the father's property as well as another portion of the inheritance that also went to all the others. So he got twice as much as all the other brothers and sisters. So Elisha says, Elijah says, what do you want when I go up? He says, God, I want, I want a double portion. He's starting to recognize he's a son and he's a father. He says, I want a double portion of what you got. I know you got it from your father, God. But I, I'm starting to see this now. I want the best you have. Oh, come on. Some of you are reaching for second best. 
Some of you haven't stepped into the best that God has for you. You're going to say, God, I want your best. I want, come on, I want all that you can give me. My God, my God. Wow! And God doesn't come in portions. My God, God's portions are limited. There ain't no dimension to it. Father, 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 Father. I tell you, see, when you're a child, you call him Abba, Daddy. Oh, he's just my daddy. But when you get mature, you say, Father, Father, Father. When you're just a little boy, you say, Daddy. That's the word Abba. He says, he says and he is Abba, Father. That means Daddy, Father. Abba is the word for growing up to understand fatherhood. But Father is saying, I understand I'm really your son. You see, that's why he prayed, Our Father, which art in heaven. Hello, be thy name. Oh, he was saying, you're my father. You're my father. I recognize I'm your son. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. God, I'm a citizen of heaven and you want heaven to come down on earth. You want me to pray heaven down on earth. You want me to release your fullness on this earth. Because creation's groaning, waiting for the sons of God to manifest. So God, rule and reign through me. Let your fullness explode through me. My God, can we see it. The full expression of holiness having its rule and reign. See, if you let holiness just come into your life and flow through your life, it'll clear things up for you. And you'll see and say, wow, wow. The holier I get, the more I see God as my Father. The holier I get, the more I see God as my Father. The holier I sense God's holiness and His innocence working in my life, I go, oh, I just love you, Daddy. And innocence comes over me. Oh, you're my Father. There is none like you in all the world. And I know if the devil comes my way, Daddy's standing behind me. Go ahead, devil. Try to mess with my son. Go ahead, devil. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Amen. <laughs> Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. I paid the price for him, devil. I own him. He's born of the water and the spirit. He's my child. Go ahead, devil. The blood of Jesus is against you. <laughs> I've got him now. He knows who he is. Come on. Be the son of God God's called you to. Be the son of God you are. Be the son of God you are. Be the daughter of God you are. Nothing less. Be the son of God you are. 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 That's what I called you to, says the Lord. Be the son of God you are. I've destined you for that, says the Lord. Be the son of God you are. I don't call you to anything less. Be the son of God you are. You have no time for the frivolous things of the love of the world. You have no space for it. You have no tolerance for it. Before, even in the scripture he says, flee from even the appearance of evil. Appearance of evil that isn't even evil. It's just you look at something, it's like, it's like Kayla and my wife and my secretary when they get on the internet. Many times people are sending pornography over the internet now. Anytime you go try to get your email, you might be trying to get email from other ministers, you try to plug in your email. I mean, every time you try to plug in your email, you push that button, email comes up. Now they're bringing up naked woman straight on the screen. There's pornography coming across. I was in a hotel several months ago. I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, let me check my email and push this button to see what this mail was because I thought the mail was for me. The minute I think, the first thing that came up on the screen was an absolutely naked woman. Let me tell you, the devil is finding every way he can to move himself into your life. Amen. But what they do is the minute they see it, they can recognize it. They say, hot mail, whatever it might be. And they'll go, trash. They don't even push the button. They go right to it. It says, delete, trash, flee the appearance of evil. Come on. You can sense when something's coming up there, but sin or not. God says, flee the appearance. I, I think it might be evil. 
If you just think of my evil, get away from it. Oh, come on. The devil's not playing fair. He's been around for thousands of years. He's got the Bible memorized backwards to frontwards. He knows it, he knows it 100 times better than anybody in this room. Every time a revelation is spoken. Come on. <laughs> he's, not, he's, not, he's not like he don't know things. But we're not ignorant of his devices. Greater is he that's in us than he's in the world. I love tongues. Greatest, greatest. It's, it's the greatest guided missile that goes straight to the throne room of God that absolutely wreaks havoc in the heavens on the devil. And he absolutely hates it because it messes him up. And the Bible says no man can tame the tongue. And if your tongue's out of control, just speak in tongues. Because when you speak in tongues, God will bring it into control. You see, that's why Paul says, I thank my God, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Come on. Some of you, you start praying in tongues like that, you won't be saying half the garbage you do. Some of you, you spend several hours, come on, drive your car praying tongues, work praying tongues, whatever you do, praying tongues. You think I'm not praying in tongues, I'm praying in tongues right now, whether you realize or not. You say, brother, how are you praying in tongues? Something deep down inside my belly keeps going, something keeps praying in tongues inside of me, whether I'm speaking or not, because as my spirit beat keeps making groanings to God, God keeps hooking up. You say, brother, but you're not expressing the tongues, but my belly's still praying in tongues. You say, what do you mean? Because I can feel it. I can feel somebody inside still praying in tongues. It's called the Spirit making groanings from me which cannot be uttered. I mean, there's something deep down inside of me that's praying, and I can't even say it right now because I'm speaking forth the utterances of God. So there's something making groanings hooking me up to heaven so God can speak forth freely the utterances that He desires to speak. Amen? And, so, and you want it when I pause and I go, my belly's going, He's still praying in tongues. The Holy Ghost is still praying in tongues. He's still keeping me hooked up to heaven. <laughs> glory. My glory. I tell you, I love this. Say, brother, do you thrive on this? Yeah, I thrive on it. I eat it up. I love it. Not one revival is the same. Oh, you ask them. If I can't preach for a day, I start freaking out. Oh my God, find me somebody to preach. Help me, Jesus. I'm telling you, they know it. I freak out if I can't preach. I'm so used to preaching twice a day. We did 713 meetings in 1996. I preached some revivals, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 7 o'clock, three times a day. Let me tell you, when God gets a hold of you, you can't help but pouring forth what God desires to do. You just get absolutely addicted. Like, my God, give me the, God, I got to preach. Give me somebody to preach to. You know, I, I, I mean, come on. Find me somebody to tell something. Oh, I tell you, you got to let it take over. you got to let it possess you. you got to let the nature of God have its full expression through you. <laughs> Woo! My, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I, come on, who's sensing God doing something inside of you right now? Who's sensing God just getting big in you right now? Come on, we don't even have to do anything right now. You're having revival inside if you're just catching what's happening. Just let it happen. Say, go ahead, God, explode in me. Go ahead, God, just do whatever you want in me. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Come on. Go ahead, God. Go ahead. You just said to me, I'm always leading the way. The problem is you aren't always following. (laughs) 
I, I, I tell you, I love it because I'll say something and then I'll say, well, Holy Spirit, what do you think about that? And he'll give me the answer. I mean, just come right up. You got to be careful what you ask him. Hallelujah. <laughs> about anybody else. This is good. <laughs> End time ministry is going to be different than any ministry you've seen. End time ministry is going to be unique. Will be. It's not going to be according to a culture or according to a way of doing something. 